My name is Dan Ray, and Magdalena Freeman helped me with portions of today's presentation. I recently received a copy of Heather's book. Heather and Bill put together a Microsoft 365 Word Tips and Tricks book, and it came in the mail. So thank you, Heather, for getting me involved with the review of your latest book. Oh my goodness, thank you. No problem. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. You had me since the first chapter. That was a very creative uh, way to kick things off in your book. And Microsoft 365 Chicago is supporting Chicago public schools. So there is a QR code that you can use and leverage to take you to the website. There's also a link there for donations. And being in the Chicagoland area, I'm aware of Chicago Public Schools and some of the needs and some of the impact they have on students. So um, would encourage you to think about this Children First Fund for the Chicago Public Schools or through the Public Schools Foundation. As well, there's a QR code here and a feedback link for improving the conference. So please fill out a short speaker survey at the end. That would be helpful, as well as your impressions of the entire day. And another massive thank you to many of our sponsors here, Veeam, is one that I've worked with in the past, Avpoint, Concurrency, a little north of me in the uh, Wisconsin area, I believe is their headquarters, and uh, many that I was not familiar with before starting with this uh, Microsoft 365 Chicago. Others, like Quest and Smarter Consulting and Tigraph, I either looked up or had some familiarity with, um, but that's one of the benefits is finding out about different partners, including community partners. Crush Networks, the North American Collaboration Summits uh, down in the, uh, I believe, Nashville area, and then other community partners are highlighted here including the Microsoft 365 Cabo St. Lucas, San Lucas uh, group and the Chicago Power Platforms user group as well. There are raffles and giveaways. So if you tweet and use the hashtag M365SHY22, you have an opportunity to win a Chicago prize pack. You can see here that it has Chicago favorites. My son recently moved to Kansas City and he took us to what Kansas City is probably most famous for, uh, Hawaiian food, when we went down there. Instead of taking us for barbecue, which I've hit some of the places but not all of them in Kansas City, our son decided we should go to a fast food Hawaiian restaurant called Hawaiian Brothers. Fortunately, that's where he works now. So, you know, going there and treating him to dinner wasn't all in vain. And uh, one of the raffles here besides Amazon gift cards and that prize pack is a Xbox One X. And if you've looked at how difficult those are to obtain, even now a year after, um, that is a sought after prize. This session is called Cooking with Microsoft Teams. And my goal is to show you some of the ingredients that either you need to put together a Teams solution or things that you can download and, and bring out of Teams and put together to do different things. And I give a couple examples, PowerPoint and Teams or OneNote and Teams. They're both kind of built into the Microsoft 365 solutions. So it's just a matter of figuring out uh, with this PowerPoint, if I want to do something with Teams and PowerPoint, 
I could do something like come over to my Teams environment here that I believe I'm logged in to a browser because of multiple tenants. And I can see that I have a Teams Champs team. And then under my general channel, I have this presentation that I'm actually working from and modified a whole two hours ago. So some of the tools like OneNote and Teams, PowerPoint Teams, the Office applications like Word and Excel, they naturally work together. Other ingredients or other solutions you might need to look at downloading, obtaining. There might be licensing that you need to think about. Uh, one example we'll talk about is either using Restream or StreamYard to stream a live event from Teams if you're using an external application. There are free tools like Open Broadcaster software that you can download and leverage with, uh, in conjunction with Teams. And so we're gonna take a look at some of those ingredients. And in some cases, just like a cooking show, we're gonna show you the results, not necessarily the whole, um, some of the preparation and the results, I should say, as opposed to the whole watching it bake in the oven, so to speak. So the first thing that I'd like to cover is Microsoft Teams Live Events. And I worked at Microsoft for over 11 years and was surprised how well hidden from my perspective live events were. I figured, well, it's gotta be something special that you have to do to host or to configure a live event. And what I missed, and maybe some of you have missed, is there is a right side to the new meeting with a down arrow, and that's where live event creation is hiding within Microsoft Teams and the calendar view on the far left, what I like to call the navigation pane, I've heard people call it the left rail, side rail, all sorts of different terms for the far left of the Teams application. The official name from a screen reader perspective is the app bar. That's about the only way to denote it that I am not a big fan of. But whatever you call that left side rail, left rail, navigation pane, in the calendar, you have a content view of your calendar that can be weekly or daily or the work week. And then under the new meeting in the upper right to the right down arrow live event to schedule a live event. And in doing so, on the screenshots that I'm showing, you can see that I'm on the preview build using Safari on my Mac. So on this computer that I'm presenting from, I'm on a Windows-based computer, but on a Mac, Safari is still a preview version of the browsers that you can leverage. So you can use Chrome, you can use Microsoft Edge. Those are fully supported from a browser perspective, or the Teams app would be another option. The preview in Safari at least let me create the live event, but because it's in preview, you might want to review the known issues if you were planning to use Safari as part of actually running a live event. Now, part of a live event is this would be a curated presentation or scenario. So similar to this meeting that we're doing where I'm presenting and there are a number of people in the audience, I might want to control things like the Q&A from the meeting. And in this case, we either turn on the comments and everybody can see the comments as they come in, or we turn them off. In a live event, you have the ability to have comments between producers and presenters. So as the organizer or the person setting up a live event, you become a producer. And then you can promote other people to either the presenter role or the producer role, where they have some of the behind the scenes capabilities from the live event. And any producer or presenter have a chat function similar to what we have in this meeting. 
However, as part of setting up a live event, you decide first who can attend your live event. It can be particular people or groups within your company. It can be organization wide that still requires a sign in or it can be public where you don't require the sign in. So all three are options. And then you decide whether you're using Teams to produce the live event or whether you're going to use an external app or device to produce it. Whether you choose Teams or an external app or device, that Q&A piece is moderated questions and answers. So imagine in a session like this, we have hundreds of people attending, and those hundreds of people have questions. Instead of that being visible to everybody, including the other audience members, the questions come in and can be curated by producers or other presenters in the meeting team. And they can promote a question to be visible by everybody with an answer, or they can broadcast something to everyone. Maybe we're starting a couple minutes late. <clears throat> Maybe we experience some kind of technical issue. We can go ahead with the Q&A, promote a question about, hey, I'm not getting audio, or the audio is choppy, or I can't see the video, and acknowledge that that's an issue to everybody by promoting it to everyone, or you can actually send those messages back to the person asking the question directly. So if one person out of hundreds has issues with audio or video or can't figure something out Teams related, wonders where their chat is, why this Q&A thing shows up, why it looks different, you can reach out directly to that one person instead of the conversation being seen by hundreds. If you use an external app or device, this is the piece where those ingredients are required. Teams, you can do a live meeting, a live event within Teams without any additional add-ons. However, if you choose to maybe stream to other platforms or you have a TriCaster or some kind of physical piece of hardware that you want to leverage in the Teams live event, you choose external app or device. And then in that case, these are your choices for the event options, including what we just spoke about, the Q&A. Once you've created a live event, you have a portion that is available to the producer and any presenters in a previous screen, we saw the ability to have presenters that are external to your organization. So if I don't check that, everybody has to be part of my organization. And then I have a separate link that I send to end users to attend the live event. Now, in the past, there was a huge caveat in this link and joining the live meeting and starting a live event. And that was once you start a live event, you could never restart a live event. So if you were scheduling this, it's a really big event, it's Monday of next week, but the event production team wants to go in and test some things over the weekend. If you actually tested those in the live event, in the past, you couldn't start the live event come Monday. Now, they have introduced the capability to restart a live event, and there's some warnings and caveats about, hey, if you restart a live event, you lose the previous live event recording, and it resets a lot of things on the back end. But if you had that unfortunate situation where you were testing things beforehand, and then you come up to the actual live event, and now you can't launch it, you now have the ability to do that. So once you've selected that I want a live event and I'm using an external app, I've used both StreamYard and Restream. Both of them have settings within the application and they're browser-based, so there's nothing extra to install, but they're services that you pay for to configure an RTMP stream. And that stands for Real-Time Messaging Protocol. 
And it's the capability of teams to connect to that external app and deliver that content to your audience. The stream key in this case is not used by teams. So you can put anything in that field and you get the RTMP link from your live event. And I'll show you that here shortly. Let's go ahead and bring up my Windows Sandbox here. And if you haven't used the Windows Sandbox, pretty powerful little utility that is available in Windows 10 Pro and above. And what the Sandbox does is gives you a playground isolated from your machine with the same version of Windows that's on your computer. So it's hard for me to set up a live event when I'm using Teams because Teams is already in use. However, if I go to teams.microsoft.com forward slash download and I download the client for the desktop, the sandbox is a separate Windows computer, if you will. So I can load software like Teams. See where I've got my phone here, there it is. I can log in as either the same account I'm using or a different account. So worker school, I'm going to get my two-factor authentication. Seven nine three three zero nine. Okay. So now we're loading up another copy of Teams. It'll be in my regular tenant, not in the tenant I'm presenting from. So this is yet another way to have cross tenant capabilities. And then in the same way that we went into our calendar, we went into the right side to create a live event. I could go through the creation again, or you can see here on my calendar at 6.30 tonight, I set up the live event that we just looked at. So I can join this live event from here and hopefully it doesn't cause me any audio issues here within this meeting because it should be isolated from the standpoint of the hardware of my system. So the encoder preview shows me what's gonna happen, gives me those links that I would send over to a restream and then I can start the setup and start the stream with Restream from a, another browser. Stream.io, let's log in here. And then down here in edit destinations, I can go live on LinkedIn. I can use um, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, or Teams. And within Teams, this is where I would take the RTMP URL and copy the one here and put that into my browser. I can use a stream key, doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to use authentication here. The authentication is that ingest URL. And then I can start the setup here. And I can also stream with Studio. So in this case, where you're using an external encoder, 
Restream becomes my tool to add people, to share my screen, to play around with my camera and my uh, microphone and leverage that from Restream as opposed to in the live event itself. A live event that I host in, oops, I need to do that. We talked about this before, that like right down arrow, live event. A live event that I host within Teams itself. Same kind of thing, I decide who is allowed. I can add Magdalena to this. Decide if she's a presenter or a producer. I can allow external presenters or not, add them in. And then under next, I can decide this is public, I'm hosting it with Teams, and I want to have Q&A. And I can go ahead and schedule it. So very similar attendee link that's separate from my actual link above. I can put that attendee link in the chat here. I can join my live event from my virtual machine. I can decide that I've got my audio off since I'm using my audio in this meeting. And then this is the view that you get when you set up Teams and Teams is the one being used for the uh, producer function. So I get the ability to see on the left what I'm queuing up for folks. So I can share my application window, like show Teams within Teams, and then share that. If I make this window a little larger, I can see that I have a send live. So I send my live event and I start my live event. And this is your reminder that it can be started and how long it can be and that there's a 10 to 20 second delay for users when they come into your live event. So now my event is live. I could go to my chat, <clears throat> take a look at something that I have in my chats. And this is what people would be seeing in my live event. I've got my audio off, so there's no audio in the live event. And if I choose to, I could go over to a browser. Put in my Teams live event address. Tell it I want to watch on the web. And because this is an anonymous public live event, I can join anonymously or I could sign in. And then the live event Q&A is on the right. So what we talked about before, hundreds of people are here. I ask a question. I'm anonymous, so I can either put in a name or stay anonymous. Where's the audio? And then as somebody in the producer role, show Q&A is up here, and I can see that there was a question. And if we had an issue with the audio, I can either do a private reply to this anonymous person. I don't know that it's really Dan Ray. It could be a different Dan Ray. I have two first names, so maybe it's somebody else. Or I can publish that so everybody can see the question and then I could make a public reply. We will get it fixed shortly. 
Maybe I'm struggling with my audio source or something else is going on. And so you acknowledge it to everybody, not just the person that asked. And then I can also make an announcement to say, you know, we'll start in a couple minutes. Thanks for joining. So this is the Teams live event experience. And we've seen what the Restream experience would look like with a browser-based control as opposed to a Teams-based control with features that you might be used to in Teams, video audio capabilities, screen sharing that looks pretty similar, and even this window that looks pretty similar. I have run into situations where I want to use the control minus to make the font in my live event a little smaller or larger. You might have noticed at the beginning I couldn't see some of the buttons because I didn't have the window maximized. So maximizing the window would be one thing and then control minus if the font is just a little too big to see all the components on the page, like muting everybody. In this case, the live event audience doesn't have audio. So maybe the question would be, where's my mute button? And I'll post as anonymous here. And then in this case, because it's from one person, where's my mute button? I can do a private reply. There is no audio in this presentation. Uh, there is no microphone, I'll say. And so that goes back out to the one individual as an answer versus the where's the audio and the featured responses, we will get it fixed shortly. And we'll start soon. So that's a little bit about hopefully the coming out of the oven of a live event. Some of the ingredients, some of the different options you have to put into your recipe, and then the outcome, a live event that either can be public or that can be for just your company. Next is OBS, or Open Broadcaster Software. This is a free download that you can get from obsproject.com. So Open Broadcaster Software, it's free. And I can download this. Problem, Craig. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. There we go. So there's the link to OBS Studio. This is Mac or PC. And this is the Mac version that I have running in the screenshot. To the far left, you have scenes that you can establish in OBS. And to the right of that, you have the sources that are part of those scenes. So for instance, I have images, I have video capture, audio devices, my browser. I can show video clips and they come through with OBS just like your video camera. So if you ever wanted to present and appear that you're presenting real time with your video, you can queue up a video clip and it comes through your video just like you would if you were live in a meeting. So here's my video. I can resize it with my video capture in. And I can even, with the different scenes, bring in besides my video, maybe an image of my company, Dessa. 
And then I can resize the two and decide which seam this is in the far left, bottom left. When I switch scenes, those can have different sources. They can be display, video, images, a we'll be back shortly, or we're taking a break. Whatever you want those different sources to be, even a different camera or a different angle, can be used through OBS. And then starting the virtual camera means that you have the capability of using that as your source within your meeting. So if I go to my device settings in Teams and I look at my video choices, you'll see that I have two webcams, the Snap camera and OBS virtual camera as choices. I would then select OBS virtual camera, make sure that software is running and that it's started the virtual camera, and then those scenes are available to me and I can switch between them without having to switch my cameras around. So it's a pretty unique way to work with meetings within Teams. Next is the final thing that I wanted to share with you related to things you can cook up with Teams, and that is setting up a Teams room system. When I was at Microsoft, almost every single conference room had a Teams room system configured for our use as employees or with customers, partners, whoever was using the facility. And this is something I missed when I started working from home at Microsoft and when I went back out on my own as a consultant and trainer. Having a display that tells me what time it is, that can do some really fancy things with multiple displays, has a touch screen, can be my audio and video source in a meeting, or just a secondary display to make sure everything's coming across the way I expect it to, is super helpful. Well, the first thing I discovered was that there's a way to create your own Teams room system. So if we go back to our browser here, and we search on Teams room console surface, I think this will bring up the configurated Teams room console. document, and these are the steps I use to create my own. So there's your ingredient list, right? What you need. You need to have Windows 10 and prepare your installation media. So I need to have a flash drive of some sort. I need to install a private CA certificate on the computer that I'm leveraging install Windows 10 on the Teams room system, and then the initial setup of the console. And then there's a PowerShell script that creates the USB stick that you put in the, the Surface device to actually build a Teams room system. As part of creating the script, there are about, I think it's five, certified docs for Teams room systems. And this was my first hurdle, was I had plenty of surfaces laying around, but I didn't have a certified doc. Let me go grab mine. And I'll show you what the guts of a Teams certified doc look like. This is the inside. of my Teams room system. Let me turn off my virtual background here so you can see it better. And so it has a place to mount the Surface. The particular Logitech I have has the Surface power and then a display port connection. So it works better with the older surfaces than the newer ones. Then there's an overlay here to secure the surface in the device, and then it's on a swivel mount, so it easily 
moves around like a conference room. And then all of my power connections are on the bottom. And there's a plate to cover up and make some of those connections a little harder to maybe remove in a conference room so you don't lose cables or uh, devices, hopefully. So the device is secured. There's a Kensington lock on this. And this was one of the certified Teams room devices that you can leverage. Let me set that down. We'll talk about a couple other things here related to Teams rooms. So besides creation and a certified doc, that is what is needed to drive through the end of the setup. The way the scripts are written, it needs to be sitting in a console doc to actually get to the finish button. And so I ordered my Logitech uh, smart doc, and it was about 100 bucks used. I think it retails for 300 and by putting the Surface device into the smart dock from a power perspective, which also passes through the dock peripherals, so it knows it's in a Logitech smart dock, and there's USB and network drivers and two HDMI outs for two external displays, I was able to get all of this working. Here's the bottom and a better view of that than probably from my webcam. But I also have a Kensington dock, which was designed more for retail use. I like it because um, in this case, it leaves my ports open. So even though some of my newer surfaces have a USB-C connection instead of the display port, I can leverage it with a Kensington dock. However, the issue I had was because the Kensington dock that I already had was not supported, I couldn't set up the Teams room system in the first place. I got stopped at that, put it in the dock. It was in a dock, it wasn't a supported dock, so it didn't let me click finish. However, once I set up some of my other surfaces, they become completely usable Teams room systems once that setup's been done. And so here's the Logitech device put together with the bezel, with the base on, and what the Teams room system looks like. In this case, it was unplugged because it's a Surface device. Even if I lose power at the house, my Teams room system is one of the only things that doesn't go offline. It might lose internet connectivity, but it stays up and running. The final thing that I'm going to try to show and it may or may not work in the meeting. So I took some uh, screenshots of it was writing your own together mode scene. And this was something I saw somebody post about. And I thought, man, that sounds really cool. Having your own together mode scene. And so I searched for this. And I found, hey, there's this cool little walkthrough for having your own together mode scene. And it seemed pretty straightforward. All you need is this developer tool and you name your scene and put some graphics in and decide where the participants show up in the graphic. And then you have the ability to leverage this within Teams for together mode. Well, I was able to go to the scene editor pretty easily. You authenticate as your account into the scene editor. And then the scene editor keeps track of the scenes that you might want to play around with. This Halloween one is available. I created a pool table. You can see my graphics abilities are uh, lacking. And I can either put two people in the scene or decide how many people are in the scene. And then I can decide where they're placed into the scene. 
whether they overlap, how large their image is. And I can also assign spots as the meeting organizer or as a presenter in my scene. So I can decide if those spots are assigned to different people. And it has meeting organizers currently assigned to participant four. If you want to change that, you can. Looks like it can have multiple presenters assigned. And I think my meeting organizer is actually over here as three. And then you can save these once you've given them a name. So I could call this pool table for six. And then there's this view in Teams button that's supposed to allow you to actually use the scene in Microsoft Teams in a meeting. And this was the piece that I was like, oh man, you know, what's going on? How do I get this working? In my tenant, this would come up and say add. But then in my tenant, I didn't have the together mode capabilities up here in this dialog box. Even though you're supposed to have them with two people, I was in with Magdalena. We were testing together mode and we came down to change scene and we weren't able to get there because the change scene wasn't there. But this, once you've uploaded them and you launch a meeting, is where you would see the other scenes. So what I did with her, set up so here's where we place those two icons based on our presenter and our attendee or organizer and attendee and then if we had additional spots those show up we went into the designer again played around with the haunted house and then we went in and created a brand new scene with the IT crowd as our background. Placing the people, deciding how large they were, assigning their spot on the far right. Going back into the meeting and then we were playing the part of Roy and Moss from the IT crowd in this scene. I'm not sure if you can make, you probably can make the graphic of the monitor sit in front of you so you can be sitting behind the desk. But this was super fun to actually get this working for a custom together mode scene. And so with that, we have taken a look at <clears throat> Teams live events, and at least two ways to set those up within Teams or within a third party app. Third party app is helpful if you wanted to stream to other platforms like LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a live capability now. We looked at the capabilities from open broadcaster software. Some of the things you can do with a virtual webcam. You can overlay your slides, similar to what you can do now in Teams, but you have all sorts of different things you could do. You could put the whiteboard in front of you. I did that on one of my Teams presentations. We looked at what we can do with creating your own Teams Room Council, which is essentially a Teams Room system that you build yourself with a Surface device. Surface Pro. I tested this on a three, uh, four, five, six, and seven. And I also tested it this evening on a Surface Pro 8. A Surface Pro 8 is a larger screen 
<clears throat> a different type of connection and ships with Windows 11. So what do you think the consensus was on a Surface Pro 8 running Teams room system? Did we get it working or not? Ships with Windows 11. It's got different ports on it. So it has two USB-C ports, different keyboard configuration. Well, I am happy to report. That with a little finagling, I was able to get a Surface Pro 8 running as a Teams room system. So now I can have the latest and greatest from a Surface perspective. Running Windows 10, so I'm not dealing with Windows 11 and some of the limitations that I've found with keyboard shortcuts and things I want to use. So I can also log off this Teams room system and turn it back into a regular computer. So in Windows settings, I can go in as the administrator locally. And now I'm just in Windows 10 on a Surface Pro 8. So I can connect to additional monitors, do whatever I want, ink. And if I log off of this, the default is a account with no password and it fires up the Teams Room system experience on the Surface Pro 8. So we got it working on all those different platforms. I found the workaround was the same on the Surface Pro 8. I had to put it in the Logitech Smart Dock to get through that finish. But then once it's through the finish, there's no check that it's actually in a supported dock. So I could use a Surface Dock. I could use a Surface um, you know, designed third-party solution or whatever I want. I could use just the ports on the side of it. So very flexible in how it is configured. And with that, we have gone through a number of things that you can cook with different ingredients. Some are free. Some require licensing, like a Teams Room system is something you can build, but then you also have to have a Teams Room license in your tenant and the ability to set that up to leverage a Teams Room system. Some of the tools like Restream, are free to trial, but to get that RTMP server, which you need to connect Teams to it, you have to pay for it. It's a monthly license. And then you have some other capabilities related to Teams Rooms, OBS, which we talked about being free, and live events as well. So that is the formal presentation I had planned for this evening. Thank you so much for sticking around for this, the last session of our Microsoft 365 Chicago. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, you can find me and Magdalena on... I get rid of the... Font there, you can find us on LinkedIn. And I appreciate everybody sticking around with us. Hey Dan, it's Vanessa Tobis. That was hey, one of my one of my favorite sessions of the day. Thank it you. It was great. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the detail you put into that. Thanks, I appreciate it. It's uh, it was fun getting everything actually working. I was a little nervous about the Surface Pro 8 because the keyboard driver didn't load and Windows 10 looked like it was going to load, but I was like, this is probably not going to go <laughs> go well or it's going to take more you know, research, but I got it done in about an hour. That's not bad at all for everything that you put together. So, And no. there's a couple of things I'm definitely going to uh, take a look at. I'll reach out to you if I have any yeah, questions. Yeah, feel free. Feel free. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was really cool. I I kind of missed part of it. My my 
other computer crashed, so I had to like jump on my laptop. Oh, no but, problem. Yeah, but it's these recorded. are all being recorded too. Yeah, which they are. Be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hadn't played Thanks. around with. Uh, it doesn't look like you can switch your your uh, presentations to do the video, or that might be because I turned off my video. Yep, that's why. Have you played around with these in Teams? Yes, yes. Those are really cool too. Mm -hmm. I avoid having to figure out OBS. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had fun with those too. Mm. So I do have a little bit of an announcement. Awesome. Yeah, so we neglected to announce publicly that we had a speaker registration contest. Um, but we did challenge our speakers to bring their personal networks to the M365 Chicago community. And you all did in force. And uh, there were three people that stood out. And Dan Ray, you were one of them. <laughs> in fact, you were our $100 prize winner. Awesome. Thank so you. Congratulations. Well our top three people. In fact, uh, between the three of you, you guys brought in um, 300 attendees. Wow. That's awesome. So, yeah. Congratulations, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This was definitely, you know, when you think about the pandemic and, and things that I miss, going to events like this in person mm -hmm. are probably top of the list but the benefit of it is i didn't have to worry about who i reached out to in my network yeah top 365 event in chicago you don't want to go too far beyond chicago or maybe you know milwaukee right yeah <laughs> but yeah. uh and in the winter but yeah this on a friday it was like it's all day it's early it's later whatever works come for some come for all yeah so thank you so much yeah, and thanks for coming. No problem. Heather, this, Heather, this, thank you so much for. Session. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much for putting this on. It was a great event. I didn't do that much. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt. I doubt that. I doubt that. When I saw the uh, when I saw the slides and a really detailed explanation of how to use them, Heather, I thought if Heather wasn't involved, <laughs> uh, I would be shocked. <laughs> Yeah. Those were great presentations. How to use thoughts. them was me. I actually, I, I was disappointed that there was too much text crammed into like those slides, but you know, iteration 3.0 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll cut down on that and make them. I thought I didn't want any feedback from you on how much of them I had to read because I hadn't really thought through how I was going to present those. Oh, my slides were like, you know, you know, yeah. Mine were heavy too. Yeah, they they worked, but um, yeah, there was a lot of information on some of them. I loved that you did the QR codes. That's oh super yeah, watching these types of things, where you're not trying to capture a, you know, an address and oh, I I didn't get the end of the address. What's you know, what's the hashtag I'm supposed to use? So totally. really good job with those. Well, throughout the day, we've been taking notes ourselves for what will do differently next time and i don't know like every event we've kind of gotten better at certain things but i kind of feel like we took a step back in some other areas <laughs> this time. so like we kind of forgot a few lessons and i'm like like there are like a few things where like didn't we do that last time like why didn't we do that this time and so like what happened and i, I think it might have been just the fact that it's january and we like came off of a holiday and it's just we had a holiday haze and we're like why didn't we do that like, why didn't we do that and yeah so I don't know. kudos to you and the rest of the team i mean this this was uh well communicated um really appreciated all the support um, thanks for making me a presenter. I was getting a little yeah. nervous. I'm like, I don't know. If you're getting you right, but I've seen some other people ask in the chat, so I'll ask in the green room. <laughs> that was something that was a last minute like glitch in the system. Like we had set it up so y'all should have just been presenters automatically, and that okay. just didn't happen. And 
Yeah, and then we're like trying to make all the moderators all have permissions to do it, and then that didn't. It was just we we're putting out fires. Yeah, so <laughs> well, it went over well. It did. It did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And by we, I mean the guys. I had nothing to do with that. (laughs) Well, thanks so much. All right. Any other questions? Let's see. We have two other folks still in here. I think the chat should be open. Okay. Well, Heather, Vanessa, thank you so much.